My name is Stella Natupe, and I work for the City of Chicago, Department of Business Affairs and Consumer Protection. Welcome to the BACP Business Education Workshop Webinar Series. We have adapted our regular business education workshops at City Hall into these webinars until further notice. On behalf of our Commissioner, Rosa Escarano, I want to inform you that business licenses can be processed online by visiting www.chicagobusinessdirect.com. Dot org. If you are a part of the BACP Entrepreneur Certificate Program, you can get credit for joining this webinar by sending an email to BACP Outreach at cityofchicago.org. If you want to learn more about this program, please visit chicago.gov forward slash business education. To help guide you, to help guide your business and employees during this reopening process, please visit www dot chicago dot gov forward slash reopening also BACP and the city of Chicago's office of emergency management and communications created shy biz alerts you can opt in to receive targeted emergency alerts for the business community if you are interested please visit chicago dot gov forward slash business shy biz alerts again that website is chicago dot gov forward slash shy biz alerts we would like to encourage all of our attendees to ask questions. Please use the chat, bo chat box and send your questions to all panelists. There will be a Q&A session at the end of this presentation. Today's webinar is entitled, Understanding and Clarifying Your Brand Identity, presented by Stacey Codwell, Center Director for SBDC. I would now like to turn this webinar over to Stacey for us to begin. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, BACP, for allowing me to host this webinar for you. I'm really excited, it's a good one. It's a topic that I love, understanding and clarifying your brand identity. And so um, I am, as she mentioned, I'm Stacey Fitz Caldwell, and I am the Central Director for the Illinois Small Business Development Center at the Chicagoland Chamber of Commerce. I'm also the um, small business director for the chamber, as well as I own a small boutique graphic design firm called SP Creative. Um, so you can, here's our Facebook information for the center, as well as for the uh, graphic design business. So I want to get started today, give you an agenda of what we're going to go through. This is, we've got an hour and a half this afternoon, which is great. Um, it's a lot of information, a lot of tips, a lot of takeaways. Um, I've got some worksheets for you guys that we're going to try to throw in the chat or send after the, um, the presentation. Um, you'll get it directly from the city. So today we're going to talk about a brand identity, an overview of that. We're going to go into visual identity, which is local website and colors. We'll talk about mission versus vision. We'll talk a little bit about the differences there. Um, I've got a couple of videos for you guys so you can really understand some of this content. So brand communications, what key messages look like in an ad for different companies. Um, I've got 12 brand character personality styles for you to look at so you can sort of understand how, how that makes or how that plays a, a part in communicating your brand. And then we'll talk a little bit about brand storytelling. So uh, we'll have some time for questions at the end. Go ahead and throw your questions in the chat. Happy to answer them. So let's get started. So what makes a brand? Your brand is really comprised of all of these things. So strategy, how you advertise, your design, the value, whether people, your customers trust you or not, marketing, obviously your logo. And what we're going to focus on today is your identity, which identity is the collection of all the elements that you as a business portray to your customer. It's a little bit different from brand image and branding, the term that we use, um, although they're interchangeable, but the term branding really refers to the practice. So how you market out this collection of elements. Um, it's, your, it's the perception of the company um, in the eyes of your you know, consumers. So I want to go through four benefits of a strong brand identity. Um, the first one is strong branding makes you memorable, right? So basically, 
you know, if you have a strong brand, it's really because it's more about the brand and how people perceive it and what they saw, the impressions, um, do they align with it? Can they relate to it? And that and some things and engaging activities that you can do as a business to make yourself memorable. It's really common sense. Um, a solid brand identity consists of your, your standardized font, a color, a logo, and all the choices that you use consistently to make um, your marketing materials really represent the brand. The second benefit is brand recognition builds trust. And so if your website is designed very smartly, then it can appear very strong for your business. And I like to, I like this point because a lot of times we have pretty funny looking websites. Maybe the colors are totally different from what you're advertising on social media. Maybe it's not clickable. The fonts at a 10, things like that don't work. So understanding the bridge between what your website says about your business and what people understand about your business is very important. The third benefit is your strong branding filters out bad leads. And this is a really good one because um, people don't understand, like you can totally fil filter out people that customers that aren't your best customers. And so what, is, what does that mean? You want to do business with the people who are most aligned with your core values as a brand, but they have to know what those are. So the brand is how you communicate that. Being consistent, having a strong identity really helps that. Those are the people that are going to be your really uh, your best customers because they're looking and they align with your products and services. It also supports product launches and I'll add their service, new services that you might provide because it's easier <laughs> to really kind of beta test or pilot test a service or a program with customers who already trust you. They're already convinced that you add value. And so when you have that strong identity, you can roll some of those things out, create a customer focus group and really get some strong feedback on how to improve your products and services. Gonna just make my screen a little bit larger here. All right. So here's the takeaway. So there are several things you can do to support a cohesive brand identity. First, take a visual inventory of your brand. Are you using the same logo across platforms? And what does that mean? So that means on Instagram, if you have a graphic version of your logo, but then on something else, you're just using text font to just have the title of your business, that is inconsistent. Um, now, what you can do is have different versions of your logo, and we'll go into that here in a second, where you're using them ac across platforms that make sense for however you're engaging that audience. Um, but the key there is, are they consistent? Analyze your messaging. Is your website's content an accurate representation of who you are as a business? Does it have a clear point of view? Is it consistent or across platforms? And then here's a, here's a good one. Are you providing material, material for each stage of the buyer journey? So do you have anything that sort of supports where, you know, your sales cycle, where your customer might be? So maybe they're looking, you know, to buy something and they're on your website, but they just really, you know, they, they, they abandon the cart or something like that. So you should have messaging and communication to make sure that that part is accurate. Let me make my screen a little bit bigger, see if I can get this right. I'll make sure you guys can see. Okay, that should be a little better. Let me know if you guys, if this is better. So the next one is create a game plan. So are there things you can update yourself right now to at least make it a little bit more cohesive? <laughs> if bigger changes are needed, set a budget, find some good partners to work with, whether it's a website designer or a graphic designer or someone who could help you with Canva or something like that, but know what, prioritize what's most important. But there's some things you, you might be able to do right now to make it better. And then if you have staff, get your staff on board. 
it's not just the appearance, it's really the experience that people have with engaging with your, 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 um, your staff. So if you have someone who answers the phones, then you need to have that conversation with that person to make sure whatever your brand style, personality, or feel is, they're interacting with people in that way. All right, let's move into visual identity. So visual identity is really logo, colors, slogans, any photography that you might have. So logo basics, um, your formats. When you get a logo designed for your business, there's tons and tons of ways to get it done. But if you're talking about a brand and you're really trying to strengthen your brand, you wanna make sure you have it defined so that you have the right format. So some of these file extensions are an example of that. So just so you guys know, image uh, files of your logo are just that, they're images. So if you blow them up, you wanna put go on a billboard, you wanna go on something, on a banner, a large, a pop-up banner or a large scale um, banner, it could pixelate if you don't have the correct format. So the .eps version that you see here, the first one means it's original artwork. And if you have someone who has designed your logo, they should absolutely have given you that file. And if they didn't, you should ask them for it. Um, you will not be able to view it. You may not be able to view it, but when you send this file to printers or whoever's printing large format items for you, they will have the correct software to um, view it. Those are called vector files. Those are original artwork, sometimes called native artwork. Also, you know, get your logo in different versions, an all white version, an all dark version or black version and full color um, so that you can use it more, um, you can have more flexibility in use. The one thing now that we see a lot of are people asking for their Instagram profile thumbnail picture, which is a very small version of specific measurements for the logo. So sometimes you'll have your logo, you'll try to put it on Instagram and it's like cut off. So you can always resize that <clears throat> and ask a, your designer for that. You know what slogans are. Slogans are important if you really have a powerful message and you wanna, it's, it's kind of like your differentiator or what you're, whatever you're trying to communicate. So you can have that as a part of your identity. Any pictures that you have, you can select two or three or three. I have three to five here. Five is excessive if you're not doing heavy marketing, but two or three is good if you're going to represent your brand in a certain way. You have a certain image you want to portray. You could go to Adobe Stock. You could go to any of those if you want to select something that aligns with your brand. If you don't have your own, we always say get your own if you can. And yes, typography matters too. What is typography? It is your font. So the font that you see all the time. For some reason, you know, Target, who's a huge brand, we always know when Target is, is, um, has written something. It's the font, I don't know what, what it's called, but you can always recognize it. So that's important. Here's just a spectrum of um, colors so that you understand what it's sort of, this is on the psychological side of graphic design and logo and what emotion does, but what emotion does the color in your brand ignite for your customers? So if you are a, look at all the green brands, these are popular right now. Obviously a color's in between, the color on the spectrum in, be in between, like between blue and purple might be a teal um, or something like that. But these are just, this is just here to show you that they do inv invoke emotion. And so if you wanna be optimistic, friendly, excited, bold, you know, creative, think about that if you're actually going to design a new logo or getting something from uh, done from a designer. Also, a brand board is really helpful in trying to establish your brand, right? So what this means is you're, the person that creates the logo for you can say, hey, here is a brand board so that you have in one place your, your logo, the different types of logos. So if you can see on the left here, it's here's a black and white version, here's a, a typography version, but it defines the, the font type that they use. So you'll always have it no matter what. And also the color codes, which we call hex codes. And that is definitely important for when you're trying to translate your colors. You wanna keep that color when you're printing on your marketing materials. If you do t-shirts, things like that, that's where that comes into play. 
oftentimes a designer will also include brand patterns or suggest a brand pattern. That's just so that you have something that looks good with the logo that you could use on your marketing materials. Some companies that are a little bit bigger who are really protective of their brand will establish brand guidelines. And that is really specific, specific sorry, as you can see here, um, you know, guidelines on how to use the logo. So these are our pictures that we always use down here. You can look on the right here. Those are the images that they would always use. And so do you, if you have brand guidelines, you should be giving them to your vendors and your partners so that they know, and there's no question on how they can use a logo. A quick example would be, you know, we worked with a partner and their logo was so big. And so we made it really small, but they had some font on there that wasn't, we couldn't read it once we made it smaller. So they sent over the brand guidelines on how we could readjust and use a different format so that it worked. So that's an, a quick example there. And then website, visual identity is also, website is also a part of that. Um, just a couple of basics on, on websites. Websites are not like they used to be. You don't have to spend, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars on a website. There are uh, plenty all-in-one website platforms like Wix, Shopify, Square, Squarespace. WordPress is still around and still doing well. It is coding moderate. So if you're gonna use a WordPress uh, site, you need to make sure you have somebody who updates that and maintains that for you if you're not uh, familiar with code. Whoops, I went back too, too soon. Um, and then a couple of design tips, images, videos, feeds, blog, not too much text <laughs> because what people don't like to read as they're scrolling, they want to get to the point. So even you're about like, if you are um, a part of the brand, if you have a story, and we'll go into storytelling in a little bit, you should be telling that story on video as opposed to writing a long paragraph description. If you must do a description, a short paragraph, two to three sentences, maybe five or six would do it. You definitely don't want to do too much text. Your website also should be collecting emails with a subscribe, either pop up or at the bottom. Um, that's just smart business so that you know you're capturing information and when you're ready to communicate to your potential customers, maybe a sale or a promotion, a new service, any alerts, you you're building your, your email list there. Um, it should be easy to navigate for tablets and cell phones. So make sure that if you have someone doing it for you, ask them, hey, is this a mobile friendly version as well? Um, there are all types of technical codes, which I won't go into in this workshop, but um, Google Analytics and now Facebook Pixel, um, SEO optimization and keywords, those are all important. And if you're not familiar with those things, but you want to look at it to use it to help boost your business and build your, build your brand out, then you should ask those questions and, and maybe work with someone who is more familiar. All right, the next thing we're gonna go into basically is mission versus vision. So this is like, um, I like to say, this is the stuff that we skip over as entrepreneurs from time to time, right? Because we know what it is in our head, We've got the vision, the big dream, um, we've got the mission, but what's critical here is that you can succinctly communicate this with others. That's where it has to come out of our heads and into, um, and into our communications. So basically your mission statement drives the company, right? It's, it's what you do, it's the core of the business, it comes from your object, objectives and what it's going to take to get there, and it shapes the culture. Whereas vision is the big dream. Vision is I want to conquer the world. You know that that gives you a really good um, understanding of the difference between the two. It is the future of the business. You know it's it's the purpose and it keeps you on track. So you almost never arrive. You almost never conquer the vision because it's that's what it's supposed to be. It's grandiose, right? So vision statement questions would look like, what are our hopes and dreams? What problems are we solving for the greater good? Who and what are we inspiring to change? So here's some examples. So here's Whole Foods um, mission and vision statement here. Their vision is Whole Foods, Whole People, Whole Planet. So I don't know if Whole Foods is serving the entire planet just yet, um, but that's their vision. 
their mission though is a little is is a little bit more clear is a little bit more um um in detail so whole foods is a dynamic leader in the quality food business we are a mission driven company that aims to set standards of excellence for food retailers we are building a business in which high standards permeate all aspects of our company. Quality is a state of mind at Whole Foods Market. So you can see the difference there. Ferrari has a good one. Ferrari, the vision, the big vision, the big dream. Ferrari, Italian excellence that makes the world dream. So you, you can see the grandiose there. And Amazon, which I might add, Amazon's pretty, pretty darn close to conquering uh, some things here. But their vision to be the to be Earth's Earth's most customer centric company where customers can find and discover anything they might want to buy online. Anything. So that's pretty grandiose. All right. So before we go, we're going to head into brand communications. Um, I have a worksheet for you as a business owner to sort of think through how to write your vision and mission statement. So we'll include that um, in the uh, in the post email. All right, brand communications. So brand communications are really about key messages. And we've got some brands that do it so good. And so I wanted to show you a couple of examples of that. Um, I'm gonna do this video. Let's see if the video works, if you can hear it all right. If not, I'll walk you through what's happening. But basically this campaign, um, it, it started as a, as a commercial with the stigma behind playing sports. So let's see if we can get that going and then we will, we will look at the key takeaway. Hi, Erin. Okay, so I'm gonna just give you some actions to do. I just do the first thing that comes to mind. Show me what it looks like to run like a girl. Here. Show me what it looks like to fight like a girl. <laughs> now throw like a girl. Oh. My name is Dakota and I'm 10 years old. Show me what it looks like to run like a girl. Throw like a girl. Fight like a girl. What does it mean to you when I say run like a girl? It means run fast as you can. So do you think you just insulted your sister? No. I mean, yeah, insulted girls, but not my sister. Is like a girl a good thing? Actually, I don't know what it really, if it's a bad thing or a good thing. It sounds like a bad thing. Sounds like you're trying to humiliate someone. So when they're in that vulnerable time between 10 and 12, how do you think it affects them when somebody uses like a girl as an insult? I think it definitely drops their self-confidence and um, really puts them down because during that time, they're already trying to figure themselves out. And when somebody says you hit like a girl, it's like, well, what does that mean? Because they think they're a strong person. It's kind of like telling them that they're weak and they're not as good as them. And what advice do you have to young girls who are told they run like a girl, kick like a girl, hit like a girl, swim like a girl? Keep doing it because it's working. Somebody else says that running like a girl or kicking like a girl or shooting like a girl is something that you shouldn't be doing. That's their problem because if you're still scoring and you're still getting to the ball on time and you're still being first, you're doing it right. It doesn't matter what they say. I mean, yes, I kick like a girl and I swim like a girl and I walk like a girl and I wake up in the morning like a girl because I am a girl. And that is not something that I should be ashamed of. So I'm going to do it anyway. That's what they should do. If I asked you to, to run like a girl now, would you do it differently? I would run like myself. Do you like a chance to redo it? Why can't run like a girl also mean win the race? Uh, 
All right. So this is a pretty this is a pretty pow powerful stance always like a girl campaign. You may have heard this. The point I want to get across, I have two more examples, but the point I want to get across is that their key messaging, which is girls are just as fit and capable as boys are, particularly during during puberty, that's the call out because of their product, obviously feminine products. Um, targeted, their brand is mostly targeted toward that age range. And so this was brilliant. This was a brilliant key messaging campaign that they were able to do. So um, the key takeaway is acknowledge not just your audience, but the challenges they face, especially the ones that reflect your time or culture. Not every societal issue is off limits to marketers and advertisers. Take a stand on the ones you know your audience supports and you'll access a customer base that identifies with your passion. So that's tied into what we were talking about. So the question, you know, how do I do this? These people, these businesses have billion dollar campaigns. You can do this as a small business. Once you understand what your key messages are, you find ways to engage around that, those key messages. You can do that on social media. You could do that with customer campaigns. And there are lots of different ways to figure that out. So let's take a look at the next one. Oops, that's not the next one. This is Google. So Google has a year in review every year. They, it comes from a written report um, that they submit about the most common Google searches. And so after um, they, they finally just turned it into an, a, a key messaging ad for them because they found out that the things that people were searching the most were the things that they were also as a company passionate about. <laughs> The most human trait is to want to know why. And in a year that tested everyone around the world, why was searched more than ever. The spread of the coronavirus has passed a significant milestone. And while we didn't find all the answers, we kept asking. Some questions inspire joy. Others excite me. I don't know what an improper fraction is. Keep all of those distractions out of your way. Yeah. 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 It's still March. How many days in March? Some questions made us cry. You know, we've been through our ups and been through our downs. I think the most important part is that we all stay together throughout. I love you guys. Some made us worry about this spinning rock we call her. Some detectives in the Amazon rainforest. Why were so many lives lost? Almost 1.5 million people have now died of COVID-19 worldwide. Why are we still asking the same question? George Floyd repeatedly told the officers that he could not breathe. So why do we still have strength to continue? Massive Black Lives Matter echoed from thousands of protesters in cities around the world. Why are we not defeated? We have made too much progress, and we are not going back. We are going to call on. To start into a ride in their week for international aid. Firefighters from around the world arriving in California. This is one of those times when people look out for one another and have each other's backs. We kept going for those who showed us the way. Think about how you would like the world to be for your daughters and granddaughters. Remember, the struggles along the way are only meant to shape you for your purpose. Press on with pride. And press on with purpose. Why is it that this year showed us its worst? But we still found ways to try. An incredible feat for my Gabriela. They have been the Championship. And it's the bonus value. And that quarantine style. So until we get to every answer. We're still searching. All right. So that one. 
that this particular ad pulls on emotion. So we talked a little about it, a bit about it earlier, eliciting emotion. Uh, the key takeaway here is remind your customers how much you care that they care. Um, sometimes stories elicit a variety of emotions, ultimately uniting people, no matter what Google products they might like. Because I'll be honest, some people just use Google to search. And so maybe some people know, don't know or know if they what products they have. But when you have a, a, a ad that speaks to your customer, maybe I might go on Google and look for their products and see what they have to see if I can use them. So it kind of translate that way. For small businesses, it translates to, do you have some questions that customers are constantly asking you and that you are answering? Why not turn that into sort of a Q&A video where you're answering all these questions and then you can put that out into social media and that's a way to engage your customers. So this has been really successful for Google. Let's look at the next one. This is my favorite one. And so this is Apple because obviously I, I, I'm an Apple person. I enjoy Apple products. Um, so they have many great campaigns, but this one's from back in 2006, I believe it was. Um, and, and this basically is the Mac versus a PC debate. And um, the key takeaway here is, is really they experienced a 42% uh, market share. This one's pretty short, so let me just play it. Hello, I'm a Mac. And I'm a PC. Boxer! 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 Inside, you okay? No, I'm not okay. I have that virus that's going around. Oh, no. Thank you, better, you better stay back. This one's a doozy. That's okay, I'll be fine. No, no, do not be a hero. Last year, there are 114,000 known viruses for PCs. PCs, not Macs. So, just grab this one. Yeah, I think I got a crash. Hey, if you feel it, that'll help. Good. So this was so popular they they really launched it that sort of established a great brand identity um not that mac and apple didn't have one before but a lot of people could really understand it so this was storytelling really at its finest um the key takeaway here is just because your product does some pretty amazing things doesn't mean you need to hit everybody over the head with it instead explain the benefits in a relatable way that are really creative um, so that they can see, they being your customers, can see themselves using your service or your product. There are really creative ways to do that. So, um, a couple of more takeaways on brand communications and key messaging. It's basically, you know, you really have to figure out what you want to say. Say it very succinctly, very clearly. You might have to practice this. You might have to bounce it off some some people that are, you know, your your trusted advisors around you to make sure that it's communicating what you want your brand to communicate. Um, they should improve consistency, accuracy, and stability in in your communications. It should fo you should focus your thoughts when speaking or writing to ensure that everyone understands what your company is all about. Give direction to major company elements such as your website, any ebooks you might have, blogs, sales, sales materials, landing pages, any content you, you've got out there. And get everyone in your company on the same page so there's no confusion and a wrong way to, to communicate when speaking to customers or stakeholders or particularly media interviews. So really, all this is saying you really have to make sure that everybody is on one accord. You should analyze your choices to make sure that you aren't using the same message as your competitors, obviously. So you wanna focus in on what your niche is um, and your benefits you provide. So you wanna always talk about the benefit and not the service feature or the product feature. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, you wanna keep it conversational natural and true so that it's not sale it doesn't come off as a sales pitch when you communicate benefits rather than features it's less salesy um an example is valspar the, here's an example from valspar it's a company um their key message they make paints and coatings and all that stuff um the company's key message focus on re reliability innovation performance expertise and integrity and so they say Valspar is committed to helping customers meet their most pressing challenges. Supporting facts include counsel customers on safe use, transportation, and the disposal of their products. 
So that is a way to connect with their customers rather than just connecting on what is the next, you know, project you have for paint. Um, so that's very important to think about as you start to communicate out or develop your key messages. You should be able to back up them with facts, you know, fundamentals about your business. So example is our company, instead of saying our company is the best in customer service, you should say our company has consistently high rankings in national surveys for the exceptional attention we give to each and every client. So sure you can see the difference there. All right, so we're on to brand personality. I'm going to throw the Marketing Ever Worksheet for you for marketing messages to help you create your own. I believe I'm throwing them in the chat. Again, if you miss any in the chat, they will be emailed afterwards. So let's jump into brand personality. So brand personality is really how you are, you know, what style, you know, what type of, what tones, what conversation, what do you align with, what's important to the brand? Because um, people don't buy just your service or your product. They're really, you know, it's aspirational. Like, I like this brand. Like, I love this brand and I can see myself being better because of this brand. That's really what it's about when we're talking about brand personality. Your brand's personality is the lead character in a story. I'm going to get to storytelling that speaks to their desires and aspirations. Most brands, most, not all, but most brands will fall into one or a mix of the 12 main character types. So here they are. The purist. So the purist champions values such as wholesomeness, ethics, honesty, simplicity, purity, Examples of this brand are Dove, obviously, Disney, Sesame Street, right? Um, the brand personality can be described like Julie Andrews, if you know who that is. Um, the second one is Pioneer. Um, Pioneer is, they. it's like freedom, adventure, self-discovery, self-reliance. Um, Jeep is the greatest example of that, as well as uh, brand personal, personality, Stephen Hawking. A source brand is, you know, reference, right? So embraces knowledge and enlightenment. They champion values such as truth, objectivity, education, discipline, clarity, commitment. Brands that you look to for information, advice, and insights, and maybe data even. Um, a source brand example is Bloomberg. McKinsey, eMarketer, the brand personality is Dr. Phil. I don't know about that so much anymore, but um, I could go with that. Conqueror is the next one. The Conqueror brand, you know, all day long Nike, right? Associated with performance, re resilience, you know, steadfastness, character. Um, Nike and Weight Watchers would be in this category and the personality would be none other than Michael Jordan. We've got the Rebel. So is your business like the Rebel, you know? Independence, a little controversy, freedom, non-conformity, disruptors. Um, these are brands that are, you know, willing to go a little bit out there, but that's who they are. Harley Davidson is a great example. Red Bull is a great example. And uh, WWE is also another one. The personality, you can think of Madonna, someone like Madonna. The sixth one is Wizard, you know, specialize in taking the ordinary and transforming it into the extraordinary. Wizard brands champion values such as imagination, surprise, curiosity. Um, Apple is one of those brands and Pixar is a great example and brand personality similar to like Steve Jobs. The seventh one is a straight shooter. So values and authentic, keeping it real, being frank. They prioritize function over appearance. And so Southwest Airlines is a really great example of that. Um, and the brand personality, Simon Cow. So some of you know might know who that is. The eighth one is seducer. So brands that are associated with values such as beauty and pleasure and desire and all of those things. Um, Victoria's Secrets would be one. De Beers would be one. Um, personality style would be like Marilyn Monroe. And then the last four. So the ninth one is entertainer. So you think about spontaneity, charm, humor. Um, they enjoy helping their customers discover the fun side of life. So Dr. Pepper and m and if you've ever seen any of their campaigns or ads or how they message, it's all about fun. Um, 
Protector is the next one, which is compassion and kindness and care and love. Um, Johnson and Johnson would be one. Campbell Soup. Um, brand personality would be Mother Teresa, if you think about it that way. Um, the next one is Imagineer. So original thinking, you know, art artistry, creativity. You know, these are Imagineer brands. You know, these are brands that help their customers create. And um, example would be like YouTube and Lego and Photoshop. Um, Michael Jackson would be the brand personality there. And the last one is Emperor. So leadership, determination, respect, dominance, influence, wealth are values associated with Emperor brands. Good examples are American Express, Porsche, um, and Rolex. And so if you think about a personality there would be Warren Buffett. So these are really, really good ways for you to think about what does what is the personality that my brand, you know, aligns with. Um, and if you think about it that way, there's a good there's a good um, opportunity to tell that story. There's also a good opportunity to think about it in a way that makes you makes it a little bit easier to create brand authenticity. So next, we're going to go into brand storytelling a little bit about it. I've got a couple of videos here. Um, this one is from GE, which is a really great. So we, when we think about telling a story that really is tying into your product or your services, um, here's an example. Molly, can you please take out the trash? <laughs> I reprogrammed the robots to do the inspection. It's running much faster now. It's amazing, Molly. Thank you. So really cool about sort of the, the little girl who always was thinking about creating something to make things easier great message and storytelling for GE because, you know, that's what they do. So this is really, really, um, if you think about how to tell your story, this is something to consider because it's really easy sometimes to, to overthink it. <laughs> um, and so when you think about what you're offering, what the product is, Think back on how did it come to be? Was there a problem that you were solving? Is there a, a, someone that expired you? Is there some solution oriented um, meaning behind this? You know, think about it that way. And then, you know, go ahead and, and tell and tell oh, that yeah. story. So storytelling is and isn't. This is a good chart because sometimes we want to think of it as a sales pitch or, you know, what our goals are and, and about our brand specifically. It's not really that. It's more of what you have to think about what motivates the team. What does your brand stand for? Not who is the brand and what is the brand, but what does it stand for? What do you know about your customers? Can you tell a story there? It should be emotional engaging. People should hear your story and be like, wow. So they can see themselves sort of in that role. Um, it should have a beginning, sort of a, a problem or a, a challenge and an ending. And then it really should be about an interaction between your customers and your brand. So when you think of it that way, it, it really helps to define and, and, and you know, tell your story. So I have a, a storytelling link at our work, worksheet as well that I will throw in the chat, but that's really important for you to think about as a brand, because then what happens is you're able to really hone in on that story that gets that those customers engaged. So I'm gonna throw that in there. And then next we're gonna look at, so as a counter, we're gonna look at some brand fails. And these are some, some pretty big brands who had some fails, um, but let's look and check this out. And then after this, we will, 
do some Q and A, and um, we can go from there. Hopefully you guys were able to see that video, but I have a little recap here. So Pepsi goes off brand message. Um, and this is important because a lot of times we are reactive to situations that happen. And if you're representing a brand, you have to really do a check to make sure that whatever issue you're going to step out on and talk about anything that you're going to align with is in alignment with your brand identity. So in the ad, tensions are mounting between the protesters and the police until Jenner magically solves everything by opening up a Pepsi for a cop, sort of making light of the situation. The brand quickly pulled the spot um, and it was released in early April. And this is a couple of years back. But basically, there's just, you know, you have to be careful. The lesson learned is the biggest brand gap Pepsi committed with this spot was putting its product in the center of a social issue while simultaneously trivializing those issues. You have to be really, really careful. If you're going to be a part of a social issue that's really big, you've got to make sure that you know how it aligns with your brand identity or you should not engage in that way. So that is Pepsi going off message. And then I think we have another one. Um, this is a McDonald's one, so I'll go, I'll go ahead and play this one. Come on. Yes, sir. What was that like? Big and cuddly at that. Tall house. Big, big hands. And little. I was never scruffy. Always smart. And his shoes. So shiny, you could see your face in it. Dad played football, didn't he? Yeah, he was good. Captain. You like techno? Yeah. He was a right catchy dad. A wow with all the girls. Did he have blue eyes like me? No. Brown. I think so. What was your dad's favourite? Tartar oh, sauce. Well done to chief. All right. So I don't know if everybody was able to see that. I got a message that said it might have buffered, but I'll give you the recap here. 
So McDonald's also went off brand message with this one. So throughout the ad, the boy is clearly hoping one day, one, one of the descriptions will line up with something that would describe him and none of them do. So the mom saying your dad was this, your dad was that. And so he's sort of listening for, <laughs> for an alignment there until he's with his mom at McDonald's where then she explains, you know, that was his favorite order. And, you know, he spilled the tartar sauce on his cheek. And so after Swift crit Swift's criticism of the ad online, McDonald's pulled the spot, apologized and noted that it would review its creative process to prevent an error like this from occurring. Um, you know, why would McDonald's wanna tell a story about grief? You know, the whole gist of it is, you know, they're really, they're tapping into grief and then, you know, pair with something so trivial as to sell a fish sandwich. So um, the lesson learned is this one covers all of these brand flops. Don't exploit people's, don't exploit people's pain for an ad. It never works. It diminishes your brand messaging to your customers and it appears inauthentic. Now, a company like McDonald's can suffer this blow and pick back up and keep going. But a small business, not so much. You definitely will lose a customer if you're not aligning and not being conscious of how you are portraying your brand identity. So I wanted to share that with you. And so this kind of takes me to, um, uh oh, sorry, let me just click there. So this is, we can actually, we kind of wrapped a little early and so we can start some questions. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I'm gonna also throw, uh -oh. Someone's at front door. Sorry, that's my doorbell. <laughs> I apologize for that. Um, I'm going to also throw uh, the links in the chat. Um, I've got these worksheets. So keep in mind, these are worksheets that I use particularly in our Illinois Small Business Development Center at the Chicagoland Chamber with our clients um, to help them sort of strategize and figure out their brand and kind of get it out their head and on paper. So they should be very helpful, but they do have a two week. Um, you won't be able to open them after two weeks. So um, you can always just make sure you take a look at them, maybe download them, you can print them out um, or you can type right into them, but they're very helpful when you think about trying to um, write your mission and vision statement, when you think about writing key messages and trying to story tell for your brand. So um, I'm gonna pause here <clears throat> and see if there's any questions. Um, I'm gonna also throw some more links in the chat. Uh, that is brand identity. So I hope that the takeaway here is a lots of examples so that you can really understand what I'm trying to um, explain uh, as it pertains to small businesses, whereas these are huge businesses we we looked at, but but it's still the same methodology methodology. So you can apply those same methodologies to your business, how to engage with your with your customers, how to make sure that you have all the things in place so that your brand is consistent from your logo to the fonts that you use. And some may even say, why does it matter? Why is it important? Because it's all about impressions. And somewhere down the line, this isn't immediate. This is just a this is creating a relationship between your, your, your potential customers and the customers that you already have. And so the, the stronger your identity is, the more brand awareness you have, you can, you know, the more brand authenticity you have. And that is what creates a really great opportunity for you to sell your products and your services without, you know, sort of just putting it out there like a sales pitch. The other worksheet I'll share is also going to be elevator pitch. So um, this worksheet helps you go through sort of the elevator pitch that you can create and craft so that you've got those messages succinctly down pat and you know how to talk about your business in a way that highlights the benefits versus the product features. That If I could say it 20 million times, I would. It's benefits versus product features. You always want to you always want to hint on the benefits. You want to talk about the benefits. You want to engage around the benefits. You want to make sure you're pushing content out um, visually so that it looks the same. It's very important. Instagram channels, um, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. You want to make sure that your logo is the same. You have a look and feel that you're using all the time. Not only is it does it work to create a strong brand identity, 
but it also is easier for you. If you have all this um, inventory, you know, if you have everything done, you've got your font, you know what it is, then you always can use that as opposed to trying to figure out how to put something together each time. When you have that, it's just a lot easier for people to recognize you. And for smaller businesses, it takes time. You can be very intentional about this by using ads and things of that nature to boost posts and all of those. But really what you're trying to do is you're trying to create some brand identity so that when people come to your website, they saw the same look and feel that they did when they were on your Facebook page as in when they were on your Instagram. You want to make sure it ties in. And that is really the point of this workshop today. And so I hope everyone, um, I hope everyone is enjoying it. I'm just looking in. There's one question. Can you give an example of highlighting the benefits as compared with features? Yes. So if you have a product, let's say that you are a company that um, offers, I don't know, vegan cupcakes, if that exists. And so as a, as a business, in, but you also offer regular cupcakes. So something that you can do is you can highlight the reason behind why a vegan cupcake appeals to, you know, vegans and, you know, health reasons. And so you talk about those things versus we're the company, we sell great cupcakes, they're all tasty. So I don't know if that helps helps you in that a little bit um, with that, but that's an example there. If anyone else has any questions, yeah. go ahead mm -hmm. and... Okay. They see a few questions. Let me stop that come sharing. In. I can stop sharing. Okay. They see a few questions that come in. Um, what do you mean by materials for each stage of the buyer's journey? Yes. Good question. So when you know your buying journey, that means that you know that, for example, if you are a graphic designer and you know that. First, people will take a look at your website to see what services you offer. Maybe they're looking for a logo to be designed. And so the second part of that is, are they gonna email you and request a quote? So that's the second stage. The third stage of that might be, once they read the quote, are they saying, yes, I'm ready to move forward or I have other questions. So let's just deal with those three stages. So the first stage of that is simply, someone has come to your website and, and clicked on, you know, logo development. So I might have a trigger on there that says, um, hey, we saw that you were interested in logo development. It might be an automatic message called automations that you can set up with your website that says, if we could be helpful, click here. So that's sort of one phase of the buyer journey. The second one is maybe the person, let's jump to the third. Maybe the person has gotten the quote, they are looking at it and they're like, okay, I'm interested. What do you have in place as a business to make sure you're capturing that at the time that they're interested, right? So is it a is it a templated email that you set up with your business to say thank you for your interest? We this is the next steps, these are this is the next process. Um so when we talk about the buying journey, you as a business have to understand what that is for your particular product or service. Once you know what that is, you take each stage and see if there's an automation, an email communication, maybe it's a phone call or something to engage them at the process that they are all in an effort to get them to your end of the sales cycle. Okay, great. Another question is, I feel connected to at least three of those. How should I prioritize? to three of, three of what? <laughs> I believe it was a one slide that had um, the different types. Oh, you cut out there. The slide that had the different types of, let's see. Well, types of brands maybe. Oh, to the brand personalities maybe? Yeah. If, if that's, it, yeah, so if you are connected, that's great. That just means that you figure out, so pick those three and then pick from each one what you're most aligned with and create your own. So you can always have a mix. But what that does is that helps you keep your messages in line. It helps you to understand the types of engagement you want to, you know, you want to do with your customers. So create your own, name it. 
So whatever that is, if it's the mix of the three, name yours, pick the most prominent ones out of those three that you're aligned with, and then start sort of your Instagram profile, your Facebook, how you, how you, what materials you put out, your, your, um, your marketing materials should all sort of fall in line with that personality. Great, another question just came in. A picture represents thousands of words. What is your opinion when using a picture only in brand? I think it's a very advanced way. Um, you have to have the basics down first. Um, you definitely want to make sure you have a strong identity because a picture is worth a thousand words. So if you don't have a strong identity and you're not tuned in to who your customer base is, you might use a picture that they interpret one way than, rather than your intended purpose. So I'd, I'd be really careful about using just the image until you're pretty certain that you've established your brand so much so that you have engaged and loyal customers that understand your brand first. I think, you know, we see this a lot with um, an example I'll give is most of us, will, when we see or hear a, uh, the Old Navy commercial come on, the music, the way the people in the commercial are dancing, and we've not yet seen that it's Old Navy, a lot of us will know that. Um, but that's because we we had enough brand awareness, recognition to know that. If you're a business that doesn't have that foundation with your with your customer, then it could be a risky thing to just throw out images to represent the brand. I would definitely couple that with making certain you have a strong brand identity first. Okay, great. We're getting tons and tons of great jobs, Stacey. This webinar is awesome. Um, also, maybe can you go to the very first or second slide that had the contact information for the uh, SBDC sure. and all the other? And then um, we're getting a couple sure. questions. So yeah, we're just getting a few more questions as well. Um, we will do a follow up email tomorrow with the handouts. Some people are having problems um, accessing the handouts through the chat. Okay, yeah, no, that's that's fine. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, and I'll go back to the 1st slide, but this slide has the information for you to get engaged with our Illinois small business development center. Um, it is no cost to the small business. You can set up a, a virtual advising session with our um, I have a team of advisors who specialize in different areas. And so we help businesses with branding um, strategy. Uh, capital navigating the pandemic relief. Um, pretty much any business matter that you're trying to resolve, you have an advisor will help you move through it a little bit better. And so that's chicagolandchamber.org slash SBDC. And so that will take you, you can click on new client and that will get you the link to sign up as a new client virtually. And then you'll get an email from our coordinator who can get you scheduled with, a, with an advisor. Um, so that's the best way to to work with us if you have a need. Um, I do since I own a business, um, a creative business and a graphic design firm. I do. I am particular to uh, helping businesses with branding and things of that nature. So feel free to um, put that in the request there. You may already be a client of an Illinois SBDC network. I don't want to just talk about ours, but it is a network in the state of Illinois. So if you're somewhere else and and you let's say you're you know downstate Illinois, you definitely have um, the ability to connect with an SBDC any of them. So we are just one of them. There are many in Illinois to help you. The city of Chicago is able to help you. They have many resources. So we're all working collaboratively to help small businesses during this time. So um, I will go back to the first slide as well. If I, I can see go we back have another far, let me... oh, Okay, sure. Question. You mentioned keeping a short narrative on the about section of a website or creating a video. How long should the video be in minute? One minute. <laughs> so I would say that um, here's the thing. 
you have to think about that people are only they're only with you for a couple of minutes right they're they're tuned in something caught their attention they may be doing other things and so they want to get to the point so if you have an about where it's maybe maybe it's you talking about the business again talk about it from the lens of benefits versus features maybe tell a quick story but one minute is really good because here's here's another thing when you create short snippets of information you're building your content that you can then share on social media and nobody's gonna i mean some people will watch a video that's really long but you're trying to capture um customers that potential customers or maybe people that don't know about you their their attention span is really short so i would say one minute is great 30 seconds is even better um, it depends on how complex your business is but before you do it make sure that you use your the tools i mean i, I think i put a, a i'm going to send a worksheet about how to craft that message so that it's super clear it has to be super clear the other thing i'll say about videos is we're in a time now where they don't necessarily have to be these, you know, super produced videos. You get you a good background, you know, set up some, you know, get a ring light or whatever you have to do. And you can record it yourself, do some practice ones to get yourself comfortable on camera, stay on message. And those work really, really well. Also, wear a t-shirt. If you've got your logo on a t-shirt or a hat or something, represent your brand. You have a backdrop, you do a pop-up banner or something, use that in the video. If you're gonna do a paragraph, three to five sentences should do it. Okay, great, we had one more question come in. Suppose my brand didn't work well for some years and the people already came to know it. Do you think that this will have a negative impact on my business if I change the brand? Mm, that's a good question. The first thing I would say is I need a little bit more context around it. So there are some situations where rebranding works. Um, there's also some situations where there's some at some engagement that you could do that sort of rebuilds the trust from the from the original brand. So that's a little bit more of a one on one. I would say you definitely want to talk to someone who can where you can tell them a little bit more, give a little bit more context around that. But people have rebranded and sometimes that does that does work. Um, but there are also times where, you know, if you are able to engage in a, in a way consistently that promotes trust and authenticity moving forward, there is a way to sort of recreate the relationship. OK, great. Well, that is all the questions that we have today. Stacey, thank you so much. It was great to see you. And so absolutely. lucky that we had this great webinar. Sure, really absolutely. It. Happy to and, have shared this with you guys. Sounds perfect. Um, and we will be sending that follow-up email um, with the handouts. So again, Stacey, thank you so much. Everyone, thank you. Have a great night. Thank you. Bye, everybody.